It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. So for me, uh, why I am a scientist is because I'm a mystic. And I don't mean that I'm, I entered into science to try to answer mystical problems, although it turns out maybe some of my work has some bearing on that. What I mean is um, a mystic does the same thing that a scientist does, in my view, which is to be inspired, um, have something evoked in you in a way that you don't understand. Then follow it and see where it leads and walk blindly and experience what you experience is the answer to that. And then to share what you've found. That is exactly what a mystic does and that's what a scientist is supposed to do, right? I have an idea for an experiment. Do I know where that comes from? No, I do not. Do I do the experiment? Yes, I do. And then I see what happens and then I share it. And then I have another question that comes in the middle of the night or when I'm taking a shower. And then I follow that. It's a beautiful dance with the universe. So the scientific quest and the mystical quest to me are the same thing and they're just using slightly different tools, but even the tools aren't that different. It's all observation, it's all inspiration, and it's all communication. Somebody left me a comment in the last video I made on AI and the cybernetic collective and everything. Uh, left a link to this talk given by Ben Gertzel and this woman named Julia Mossbridge. And they're talking about more of the same thing in terms of how do we design an AI that can love? How do you teach it unconditional love and create the AI that embodies the new age concept of love? course and it's pretty interesting I mean it's not the the talk itself is just kind of more of the same stuff and the audio is not even very good it's like it was recorded on somebody's phone or something but it prompted me to start looking into this Julia Mossbridge character and she's pretty interesting um, she's involved in a lot of stuff she's a neuroscientist 
she has a PhD, but at the same time, she's super deep into the whole consciousness realm, right? This talk that she did with Ben Gertzel last year in 2017 was sponsored by this hacking consciousness organization and they do they have like a conference every year and based out of san francisco of course and also by the institute of noetic sciences uh surprise surprise and she was actually for a long time um the director of the innovation lab for institute of noetic sciences and if you don't i've talked about that before if you're not familiar uh that was founded i think in the 70s by edgar mitchell uh who of course was the astronaut turned psychonaut you know he claims to have had this transcendent experience when he was in space and, and returning from space to where he felt you know unified with everything and you know, he had his mystical experience in space which is interesting of course in light of all the stuff i've been talking about for a long time exploring the ideas of you know what are the connections between space and the space hoax and how that is some sort of a cult metaphor or some sort of representation of hyperdimensional spiritual realms and all that so Noetic sciences, right? Been around for a long time. And this innovation lab that she was a part of, I mean, they've, they've got a lot of stuff on their website in terms of all these different uh, links and resources pointing people to different uh, examples of technology being used to expand consciousness and, you know, help you meditate, help you do all these things. So, of course, it's, again, all about this convergence between technology and New Age spirituality. So that incorporates AI, that incorporates all the other, you know, scientific disciplines and psychology and neuroscience and all these things. And there's, she's got a, the clip that was at the beginning there. That was one of those little blurb videos that they put out where they talk for a few minutes uh, by that SAND organization, Science and Non-Duality, which I've talked about before also. So it's, again, it's all these familiar Familiar organizations, familiar names. Uh, Mossbridge actually has her own institute, <laughs> the Mossbridge Institute. It's like everybody has an institute. And she's been involved with a lot of different companies and organizations, and she's pretty busy. Um, and she's, you know, as, as that clip <laughs> shows, she's openly talking about how mysticism and science are really far more similar than a lot of conventional scientists want to admit. So she's kind of on the forefront of pushing that discussion and talking, and you know, she goes into depth about how, in a different video, about how neuroscientists and mystics, you know, they're both very interested in the whole concept of consciousness, but a lot of times they're kind of coming at it from opposite angles, and she's kind of trying to help bridge that gap and facilitate that discussion. And uh, she actually uses this illustration of two trees that are seemingly separate, but their roots are commingled. So there's a little bit of a language problem between the world of neuroscientists on the one hand and the world of mystics um, and then on the other hand. Um, but we need to go back to the roots of experimental psychology and neuroscience. So William James, um, who's a wonderful neuroscientist and experimental psychologist, and he said, look, you have trees, um, their roots connect, they commingle underneath the earth, and at the top, they're separate. And so our, our conscious experiences of being separate and our unconscious, he calls it because he's an experimental psychologist, of, is of being uh, connected. And both of those things are true and it depends on perspective. And I think that's the closest we can get to any kind of understanding between those two communities. So yeah, she's trying to say that they're, they're seemingly separate and kind of using different terminologies and different perspectives, but really it's all doing the same thing. So in a lot of ways, of course, you know that I this is exactly what I've been trying to say, and now it's like they are saying it, they are pushing it uh, more and more all the time. So it's always interesting when you find examples of that where it's just, you know, you don't have to read between the lines. It's very out in the open. But even, as I was thinking about all this, um, you know, going back to the whole science and non-duality, <laughs> just that name alone. It kind of made me stop and think about how, you know, there's been so many things over the years that have helped give, you know, give me insight and help kind of serve as building blocks to to kind of form the lens and the paradigm that now I'm, as I'm looking at all this stuff and talking about all this stuff, to be able to kind of break it down and understand it and get to sort of the philosophical and theological roots of it rather than just dealing with things on a, you know, on a surface level. Um, and this totally reminded me of something that years ago, 
I heard for the first time and heard many times as I was uh, listening to Ravi Zacharias when he was he had a radio show is where he talks about the the law of non-contradiction and I'm just going to play this clip it's about seven minutes but um, seriously if you can kind of wrap your head around what he's talking about and get to the core of this it will be immensely helpful to you because we are now facing exactly what he is talking about more and more and more in all these different spaces and all these different arenas um, in terms of you know, non-duality and uh, sort of the monistic New Age perspective. So I'm going to play this and then expound, of course, at the end. Here is the law of logic as it applies to reality. I remember speaking, please bear with me for those of you familiar with this illustration, but it is the most incisive one that I can give to you. I remember speaking in one of CAC, in the United States Western cities when one of the professors was attending the lectureship and asked me to speak against an Eastern religion, which I said I would not do. He said, I'm an American, I belong to that other Eastern religion, let's just call it X. And he said, and I have uh, taught this X religion in my lectures and so on. I want you to speak on the subject why you do not subscribe to the dogma of religion X. And my students will take you apart after your lecture. I said, no, I really don't want to do that. I said, I've learned when you throw mud at others, not only do you get your hands dirty, but you also lose a lot of ground. And he accepted that. I said, but I will tell you why I am a Christian. I will speak on that subject. At the end of the talk, he was quite uh, vociferous in his denunciation of what I'd said. And he basically took me to task at the front of the lecture room, attacking the fact that I didn't understand logic and so on. I said, look, we're not going to get anywhere. Let's go out for lunch. You pay and I'll pray and we'll get together. So we got together for lunch and he, we started, uh, he brought a professor of psychology with him and the psychologist and I finished our lunch while the philosopher hadn't even started his. His food had become congealed in front of him and he had taken off these paper placemats of all the tables to draw out his argument. And basically what he was trying to say was this, that there are two kinds of logic. Actually, he was wrong, there are more, but he said there are two kinds of logic. One is the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction means if something is true, the opposite of it is false. If something is true, the opposite of it is false. It is called an either or logic. If I say to you, for example, there is a red car parked immediately outside the steps there, if that statement is true, the opposite of it is false. I am not at the same time saying that red car is not parked out there. It is either true or false. I've just given you a simple illustration. If it is A, then it is not non-A at the same time. You basically establish the either or dogma. And he says, Ravi, that is the law of non-contradiction. That is either or. That is a Western way of thinking. Westerners think either or. I said, I disagree with the last statement. Why don't you write it, rub it off? He wouldn't do it. So then he moved to the Eastern way of thinking. He said, in the East, you do both and. It is a dialectic. You don't say either this or that. You say both this and that. Karl Marx used the dialectical system. It was not either the employer or the employee. You put them together and you find a classless society. Both employer and employee joined together in a classless society. Funny thing, they never show you one, but they talk about it. That there is a both and dogma in the dialectic two poles of an argument there. And uh, he says, you see, Ravi, he said, the dialectical system is Eastern. The dialectical system is Eastern. And I said, why don't you cross out that last line? Because I don't agree with you, but he refused to cross it out. What he was trying to say was this. I had talked about the many contradictions in certain pantheistic worldviews very strong contradictions and he said you see Ravi if you took the dialectical system to be true anytime you came into a contradiction you won't uh, be puzzled by it you'll say this is the way they think they make opposite statements and both of them are right so if you ask one follower of religion X is God personal he says yes you ask a second follower of religion X is God personal and he says no you go to the third person and say which of these two is right and he says both of them he says that's the Eastern way of thinking. So you've got, you've got the either or, which is Western, the both hand, which is Eastern. And he was waxing eloquent on this going on and on and on. Finally, I said, can I say something to you, sir? 
He said yes, and he picked up his knife and fork and started to cut it to his first morsel of food. And as he was cutting into the morsel of food, I said, here's what you've told me. There is a, an, an either or which is Western, there is a both hand which is Eastern, and you want me to study religion X, right? Now here's my question to you, doctor. Are you telling me when I'm studying religion X, I either use the both hand system or nothing else? Is that right? That I either use the both hand system or nothing else? Is that right? Do you know what he did? He put his knife and fork down and with a very nervous expression, I wish I had the cameras there to film it, he says to me, the either or does seem to emerge, doesn't it? I said, yes, in fact, I've got some shocking news for you. Even in India, we look both ways before we cross the street. It is either the bus or me, not both of us. Do you see what he was doing? He was using the either or with which to prove the both hands. He was telling me I either use this system or nothing else. And he was staggered to realize that he used it every day. So it's not got nothing to do whether it's Western or whether it's Eastern. It's got everything to do with that which best reflects reality. And when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man comes unto the Father but by me, it is a most reasonable statement. The question is, is it true? It is a most reasonable statement. Because truth, by definition, is exclusive. The moment you affirm something, you exclude anything that challenges that. And the way you prove the law of non-contradiction is that by just talking and if anyone else stands up and challenges you against it, by challenging you, they are proving you right. That it is either what you're saying or what they're saying. Now, the Easterner understands this malady. That's why the Easterner says, when the mouth opens, all are fools. But the problem is his mouth opens to tell us that. Or as one of the famous mystics said, uh, he who knows does not speak, he who speaks does not know. Well, did he speak? And if he spoke, then he does not know. And if he does not know, does it really matter if he spoke? The law of non-contradiction must apply to reality. If you deny the law of non-contradiction, you may as well talk about a one-ended stick. It cannot even be pictured, leave alone stated. Because the opposite poles are very much in your mind of an either or there. Now, it is therefore more logically possible that all the religions in the world are wrong. But it is not logically sensible to say that all the religions in the world are right. It's either the bus or me, not both. <laughs> I love that part. That's great. Such a great way of exposing sort of the, the hypocrisy there. But as the, the guy he was talking to said, the either or does seem to emerge, doesn't it? And uh, that's so key because, okay, so even just thinking about the sand organization, science and non-duality. Just think about uh, the term itself, non-duality. And essentially that's just another way of describing monism. So it's about, you know, science and monism, or science and mysticism, science and Eastern spirituality, right? So they chose non-duality and, you know, makes the acronym SAND, but non-duality <laughs> is kind of hilarious to me because just that alone, that in itself is a perfect example of what Ravi was just talking about, to where you're using the either or logic to try and deny the either or, you know, non-duality. So duality is, is what they're rejecting or non-duality, but if it's non, it's a negation. It's, it's not that, that like duality is wrong, but you're using a dualistic statement to try and deny dualism you know it's a negation it's a distinction but supposedly there are no negations and distinctions because everything is one so it just cracks me up because yeah this is the whole thing of just embracing the contradiction embracing the both and that's supposedly like the height of you know what's so profound about mysticism right is be able to embrace things that seem to contradict but then they don't you know is god personal or impersonal well he they're both right, you know? So you make that whole question and the whole, those terms meaningless. And as I was thinking about all this, of course, I was going back to the whole issue of quantum physics and quantum computing 
and specifically how quantum computing is all based around this concept, this core concept from quantum theory dealing with superposition. Right? When we talk about particle wave duality and, and using the wave function to chart how supposedly you can only deal with where the particle or the electron might be at any given time in terms of probabilities, but you don't really know exactly where it is until you look. And this is also expressed with this uh, thought experiment. <laughs> I love how physics, quantum physics always deals with thought experiments. But the Schrodinger's cat, right? This is what Schrodinger's cat is supposed to help illustrate. It's this idea that you have this box and there's like poisonous gas that can go off, but you don't know if the cat is alive until you open the box. So until you open the box, the cat is supposedly in a state of superposition where it's both alive and dead. Which of course is ridiculous because the cat can't be alive and dead, but only because you don't know, so somehow that means that it's both at the same time. It's, and again, another example of the both and contradiction being embraced and then being used in now this scientific way where this is the reason that they're saying that quantum computing is going to be able to be so much more exponentially powerful and can solve problems faster and everything else is because it doesn't rely on typical ones, you know, binary logic, binary computing that is how transistors and everything... So the qubit, supposedly, instead of being on or off, either a one or a zero, allegedly it can be one and zero at the same time. And then when you put string qubits together, it somehow improves your computing power exponentially rather than linearly. And, um, you know, of course, quantum computing ties into artificial intelligence because they're saying that once we really get uh, reliable quantum computing hardware and, and everything, that that's just going to propel the, the AI research and development just at an exponential rate. And yeah, once once that line is crossed and once they start actually coming out with that and saying that that's what they've accomplished, then I do imagine that things could start to change really fast or really, really take off even faster than they are already. And we're, we're right on the cusp of this. They're, they're talking about it so much. And there's many different companies working on this. And you have this whole AI tech race between the U.S. and China that they're, they keep talking about. But that, to me, is what is I was thinking about it. with Just superposition itself, this, this quantum concept of superposition, is, again, another example of a, what is an ancient tenet of mysticism, of mystical ideology that has now been encouched in quote-unquote scientific terms and scientific application, which really should make us pause as believers in the Bible. And, and yes, we want to affirm that there is legitimate science versus pseudoscience. And this ties into all the things I've been talking about with quantum mysticism and Christians kind of being oblivious to really like how deep the deception really could go. Because just on its face, you you have to embrace the both and in order to believe that this is a a legit scientific understanding of you know the quantum world, and b that the things that they're now claiming to build and be able to do in terms of quantum computing is just everything that it seems to be at face value. When in reality, obviously, we know that at the core of mysticism and all things new age and occult is spiritual deception. That there are real sentient ancient spiritual beings who are guiding the whole thing and in, in seducing people and deceiving people from the spiritual realm using these false teachings using these practices in order to draw them into deeper and deeper lies and that this is essentially where the mystery religion is going this is the one world religion that is spreading in the name of science and spreading in the name of unity and tolerance and all these things you know unconditional love and that's another one where when you really break it down when you understand when people in the world and specifically people who are openly embracing new age spirituality they love to talk about you know love and light and unconditional love and that's a big thing that Mossbridge talks about in terms of ai it's about unconditional love how do you teach it and every, everyone everyone is kind of conditioned to respond positively to that idea of unconditional love. That's something that, it, it sounds great. We all want to be loved unconditionally. And it's again, this ties back into the either or versus the both and, in terms of what is love and what is and this concept of unconditional love, right? Because 
It's one thing to say that um, we, we all want unconditional love because love shouldn't be something that you're trying to earn in order to try and be good enough, try and jump through enough hoops in order to be good enough to, to be loved by someone. And then if you mess up or you you fail, that, that the love is taken away. We, we understand that love doesn't work like that. And that God's love is patient and kind and grace and that you could describe God's love as unconditional love. Even while we were sinners, you know, God loved us. He didn't wait until we were good enough because that was never going to happen. But at the same time, biblical love, Christian love, uh, is not unconditional love in the same sense that the world and the New Age spirituality would make it out to. Because there are conditions for what is love and what is not. And there are moral definitions and moral laws that define what love is. And you can spurn God's love like you can spurn someone else's love. And even if you are being loved by God and not loving him back, that situation doesn't represent some just perfect ongoing scenario of a loving relationship. It's still There's still a brokenness. So God's unconditional love, God's mercy, God's grace is just beyond comprehension. And it's just unimaginable. But at the same time, we are called to repentance. We are called to go to the cross. And that's why God can come to us with grace and mercy is because he dealt with our broken conditions. He dealt with our sin. He dealt with our rebellion. Whereas in the new age spirituality, unconditional love just means, you know, you just love everyone. You don't ask them to do anything. You don't ask them to change. You just love, 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 love. Everything is love. And the irony is that people latch onto that as, as this appealing idea because it just sounds so wonderful and tolerant and compassionate and all these words that you hear them use. But really, there's no lines anywhere. So their version of unconditional love, just like their version, just like how pantheism just takes over everything and encompasses everything, even the things that are the most evil, wicked things going on in the world and the most horrific atrocities that human beings do to other human beings, that's all just God interacting with God, right? So you can't even call it evil at the end of the day. Those are meaningless terms. The whole concept of unconditional love is, again, one of these both and fallacies because basically you're saying that everything that everyone does is love right and that's again that's being enlightened is just understanding that everything is love and hate is an illusion and so in, in reality you're just validating everything and this is this is kind of what buddhism is all about it's just about removing yourself from the tension removing yourself from caring removing yourself from trying to make those distinctions and reacting to them and reacting to things that are wrong in the world and just you know achieving nirvana achieving enlightened bliss by just becoming ambivalent to everything and just embracing the both and but nobody can really live like that. I've never met anyone who can just who wakes up in the morning and goes about their day and just no matter what anyone does, it's just all it's all love, man. It's all good when, you know, at the end of the day. There's no such thing as is right or wrong. Because otherwise you're putting a condition on somebody. So you can't you can't ever have an issue with anything anyone does or says or believes because unconditional love you're put, don't put conditions on it, which again, non-duality. Well, you're you're rejecting duality, so that's not unconditional love, is it? So again, the either or does seem to emerge, no matter what. And when you're talking to people, whether they're really into New Age spirituality or they're just, um, you know, your typical materialistic atheist, you know, this is really where everyone kind of gets caught in their own trap. If you're trying to talk about the Bible and share truth with them and they start giving you, you know, whatever their pet arguments against God and the Bible are, this is where y you can so easily and quickly just get down to the core of how they contradict their own position. Because the materialistic atheist still is embracing the both and, and they will appeal to an objective morality in order to try and deny the existence of objective morality. They, al they always do this. They will try and appeal to that there is some sort of higher purpose or design or intention, the way that human beings are supposed to be or not supposed to be in order to defend the idea that there is no design, that it's all an accident, that we're all just, you know, evolved from 
of the Big Bang. The New Agers will appeal to objective truth in order to deny objective truth. Flying right in the face of the law of non-contradiction every time. You can't live in the world without saying that if, if, if this is A, then an A is not non-A. If, if I'm telling you that the red car is parked outside, then I'm not also telling you that it's not parked outside. You know, all of language, all of human interaction, all of relationships and everything you do in any arena of life relies upon distinctions, re relies upon non-contradictory logic, <laughs> relies upon the either or, not the both and. Because then I could just say anything and everything and I could it could just be word soup and you'd have to embrace it as just as valid as anything else I might say or do. Oh yeah, yeah boss, I went to work today, but I also didn't go to work today. <laughs> you know, see how far that gets you. Either your car has gas in it or it doesn't, not both. And the answer is going to determine whether how far you can drive that day. You know, it's, I mean, this is so basic stuff and yet... You know, when you put it in this realm of, of mind-blowing quantum physics and all this just crazy technology where they're claiming to cool these, these quantum particles down to almost absolute zero so that they can stay in their quantum state and do, I mean, it's, it's like the whole idea is just to make it so intimidating that, like, how could you question it? I mean, look at all the hardware, look at all the, the engineering that has gone into this, all the years and all these PhDs, and yeah, it's very intimidating. I couldn't even write computer code that would be useful in, you know, 1985, let alone break down the technicalities of what they're doing at uh, D-Wave and all these places. But I can stop and look at something as basic as a concept of superposition and see that now this is a logical contradiction that you are trying to get people to embrace in order to then build everything else on top of it. And so that's where I think if you boil it down to that, and draw a line there and say, no, let's look at this a little closer. Then I, I think that that is, a, that, that is a very valid place to, to stop and try and discern what might really be going on. Because, yeah, now we're, it's one thing to look back at John Bell and, and all these, the, the physicists of, of the early 20th century and then all this, it's just all, oh, it's all cold, hard science, right? But now you see where it's all going. You see what it's all turned into. You see what quantum computing and artificial intelligence are all now merging into, merging into this consciousness spirituality, occult spirituality that transcends different cultures, transcends national boundaries, transcends you know religious distinctions through through the guise of technology, through the guise of science. Man, you can see where all this is going. So maybe we need to stop and, and think about like, what are the, the philosophical contradictions and the lies that have been snuck in in order to make that possible? In order, how did we get here? So just wanted to share that. That's one of my favorite Ravi Zacharias uh, illustrations and it has helped me immensely. So, and you see this, this contradiction of people trying to push the both and, but still actually you, you have to appeal to the either or in order to push anything. In order to argue for anything, you have to use the either or. You have to make those distinctions. You have to employ the law of non-contradiction to say anything mean meaningful in any way. So, hopefully that makes sense. Thanks for watching. God bless.
1936, a massive archive of Sir Isaac Newton's private manuscripts was put on sale after being kept from the public for more than 200 years. The famous economist John Maynard Keynes acquired 100 lots. For the next six years, Keynes worked on breaking the mysterious code in which many were written. These documents drew Keynes into a world inhabited by charlatans and magicians, the world of alchemy. Once Keynes decoded these documents, his view of Newton was shattered. He realized Britain's most famous scientist was also Britain's most knowledgeable alchemist. Newton came to be thought of as the first and greatest of the modern age of scientists, a rationalist, one who taught us to think on the lines of cold and untinctured reason. I do not see him in that light. Newton was not the first of the age of reason. He was the last of the magicians. Thought ancient temples hid the secrets of the universe and believed he had found in the Bible the date when this corrupt world would end. The cover-up of the dark heretical side of Sir Isaac Newton began soon after his death. At Newton's bedside during his final painful moments in 1727 were two men whose adulatory writings would start the process of turning this flawed genius into an unblemished hero. One was John Conduit, married to Newton's half-niece, and the other William Stukeley, Newton's first biographer. The pain rose to such a height that the bed under him and the very room shook with his agonies to the wonder of those who were present. Though the drops of sweat ran down his face, he never complained or cried out, nor showed the least signs of peevishness. Over the coming years, Two of Newton's passions, alchemy and religion, would be hidden. John Conduit published Newton's works, funded Newton's hugely expensive monument in Westminster Abbey, and spread Newtonian propaganda for the rest of his life. One of the interesting things about the alchemical papers is that when Newton died, on the wrappers, the man who did the inventory and wrote, not fit to be printed, because they would have destroyed that image of Newton as the great natural philosopher, or as we would call the great scientist of his day. The story of the hidden Newton begins when Isaac Newton returned to Trinity College, Cambridge, in 1667. He was only 25, yet he had lived through unparalleled political and social turmoil, civil war, regicide, the plague, and the Great Fire of London. Newton had been sheltering from the plague for two years at his country home but it was impossible to escape the religious fervor of the times. As they look round the world through their providential eyeglasses, all they can see is plague, you know, disorder, chaos, four riders of the apocalypse. Everything goes wrong. It, it's a time of absolute uncertainty and probably for most people clinging to their vision of God is the thing that gives them some continuity. People are convinced they're right and that the people they're fighting are the agents of the devil and the antichrist. Yeah. 
Newton had fervent Protestant beliefs. He was actually intensely religious. And this is, of course, not the Newton uh, of popular conception, uh, but this is the Newton that we know from his, his personal manuscript. So he's intensely religious, he's ten intensely pious, and this Puritan ethic, this austere moral code permeates his entire life. He had been shaken by the decadence he had found at Cambridge when he first arrived in 1661. It was a time, particularly after the restoration of Charles II, it was a time of uh, great fun and frolicking. And uh, I think Newton would have been dismayed by many of the antics of his fellow students. Drinking, going after bad young women in local villages. In disgust, Newton later drew up his own plan for the education of youth in the universities. All graduates without exception, found by the proctors in taverns or other drinking houses, shall have their names given to your vice-chancellor, who shall summon them to answer for it before the next consistory. Typically, Newton suggested devotion to study was the way to resist sexual temptation. The way to chastity is not to struggle directly with incontinent thoughts, but, but to avert your thoughts by some employment, or by reading, or meditating on other things, or by converse. For he that's always thinking of chastity will be always thinking of women. He's a, a very silent, thoughtful young man who I suppose looks as though he's utterly tedious from the outside. There's no evidence I think that anyone liked him at all apart from his friend John Wickens. Wickens and Newton started sharing chambers after both became depressed about being roomed with students who put pleasure before work. They have a very peculiar relationship because Wickens is somebody who uh, is of a higher status than Newton at Trinity and seems to have become uh, Newton's amanuensis, i.e. his secretary, over the following 20 years. But they must have been very close. They lived in the same rooms for 20 years. Whether it involved a sexual component, we really don't know. But it was the longest running uh, friendship of Newton's life. For two decades from 1667, Newton would be cocooned in his own private world of study. Truth is the offspring of silence and unbroken meditation. He didn't go anywhere. I mean, he rarely traveled. He never went to the continent. He was that insular. I mean, he stayed in his rooms. He worked seven days a week. 18 hours a day, and he pushed himself, drove himself. He had a library of his own that had about 1,600 or 1,800 volumes, but it was very much a world that came to him through printed matter or through manuscripts from others. In the mid-1660s, Newton had made a bold decision. I am a friend of Plato. I am a friend of Aristotle. But truth is my greater friend. Newton had decided to search far beyond the narrow boundaries of the classical teachings for new truths about the universe. He devoured the philosophy of the fashionable French scholar René Descartes. In the early 17th century, Descartes depicted the universe as a giant clockwork machine, created by God, but then left to run. At home during the plague years of 1665 and 1666, Newton had been intrigued by Descartes' mechanical philosophy. But he was suspicious of it. There was no role for God after the creation of the universe.
Whence is it that nature does nothing in vain? And whence arises all that order and beauty which we see in the world? Does it not appear from phenomena that there is a being, incorporeal, living, intelligent, omnipresent, who, in infinite space, as it were, in his sensory, sees the things themselves intimately and thoroughly perceives them and comprehends them wholly? This virtual recluse drove himself to test Descartes' theory. Was the universe really a mass of lifeless matter or a living world run by God? He became fascinated by the force that held the moon in orbit and caused apples to fall. Surely gravity was the divine force, not a matter of chance. Newton was obsessive. In 18 months, he became the greatest mathematician in the world and invented calculus that enabled him to study the movements of planets in later years. A feather or black ribbon put between my eye and the setting sun makes great colors. Descartes had said that light was created when a stream of particles hit the eye. Newton investigated whether light and color was created in the eye or by the brain, risking his eyesight time and again. I took a bodkin and put it between my eye and the bone, as near to the back side of my eye as I could. And pressing my eye with the end of it, so as to make the curvature in my eye, there appeared several white, dark and colored circles. For centuries, philosophers from Aristotle to Descartes thought white light was pure and that colors were produced by modifying white light. Eventually, Newton turned this theory on its head. Using prisms, Newton proved white light is made up of primary colors, the colors of the rainbow. By the late 1660s, Word of Newton's extraordinary scientific discoveries spread across Europe, but his religious inspiration was ignored. Newton himself wanted to design a universe in which God was absolutely present and absolutely powerful. There's an enormous irony there. In the 18th century, gangs of interpreters, most of them French, will take the God out of Newton's world and we will be left with a clockwork universe. I mean, it's a very common image of what the Newtonian world was, that it was soulless, that it was mechanical, that it was a piece of clockwork, that it really wasn't theologically motivated at all. To this day, this purely mechanical picture of Newton's universe is still accepted worldwide. But in Jerusalem lies evidence of the scale of deception that has been perpetrated on generations. Dr. Stephen Snowbellin, an historian, has come to examine some of the 4,000 pages written by Newton that were sold at auction but not bought by the economist Maynard Keynes. What these manuscripts reveal is a very different Newton than most people conceive of. A thinker who had a, a grand, unified project to uncover God's truth, God's true doctrines. This is a, a Newton who is not a cold, calculating scientist. This is revealing uh, Newton in all his glory, warts and all, if you, were, if you will. Uh, we see uh, his, his theology, uh, we see his, his science, we see his alchemy. Alchemy was Newton's dark secret. For 25 years, from about 1668, Newton devoted himself to this illegal and clandestine practice. For centuries, alchemists had searched for the philosopher's stone, the mythical ingredient that transformed base metals into the purest gold. Many fraudsters claimed to possess it. 
in some instances, it was immensely profitable. You could milk Duke or Prince of a substantial amount of money, no question. But if you got caught, it was extremely dangerous. We know that one of the customary punishments for defrocked alchemists, as it were, was to be hanged on a gilded scaffold. And sometimes they were forced to wear suits of tinsel um, as they were hanged to make it a public spectacle. Newton secretly became one of Europe's leading alchemists. These rules in general should be observed. First, that the fire be quick. Second, that the crucible be thoroughly heated before anything be put in. Third, the metals be put in successively according to their degree of fusibility, iron, copper, antimony, tin, lead. Fourth, that they stand sometime after fusion before they be poured off according to the quantity of regulus they yield, iron, copper, tin, lead, fit. That no salt be thrown in, unless upon iron to keep it from hardening. Six, that if you would have the saltpeter flow, without too great a heat, you may quicken it by throwing a little saltpeter mixed with one eighth or one sixteenth of charcoal, finely powdered. Why Newton took up the fraudulent practice of alchemy has baffled people for 300 years. He worked in strict secrecy. Even an assistant working with him did not know what Newton was seeing in the crucible. What his aim might be, I was not able to penetrate into. And his pains, his diligence, as those times made me think he aimed at something far beyond the reach of human art and industry. Two hundred and fifty years later, when the economist Maynard Keynes gazed on Newton's private manuscripts, he was appalled. He assumed the great scientist appeared to be a magician, dabbling with the occult. Today, researchers are still trying to penetrate Newton's alchemical mind. At Indiana University in the United States, Professor Bill Newman has spent years deciphering Newton's coded recipes. He has redone experiments that Newton did 300 years ago. The task has been immense. Newton, like other alchemists, believed alchemical recipes were buried within ancient texts, from the Bible to Greek myths. In some instances, he interprets the myths in a very, very exact way so that they correspond to actual recipes that you can carry out in the laboratory. Professor Newman recreates a recipe that was derived from a myth found in the writings of the Roman poet Ovid. According to Isaac Newton, this recipe, called the net, should create a purple alloy that was one step towards discovering the Philosopher's Stone. Behold the net. It worked. A purple alloy with a striated net-like surface. Worked perfectly. Newton, like all alchemists, concealed his ingredients in colorful riddles.
our body, thus compounded, is called our hermaphrodite. Being of two sexes, and it is both father and mother to the stone. Hermaphrodite refers to the regulus of antimony that you get by combining stibnite with iron at high temperature. Newton uses codes like the green lion, the sordid whore, and the menstrual blood of the sordid whore to describe other metals. So what was Newton keeping concealed? Important clues have been found at King's College, Cambridge, where Newton's manuscripts, bought by the economist Maynard Keynes, are securely kept. Professor Rotanzi says Newton's own handwritten copy of an ancient alchemical treatise reveals the secret purpose of his alchemical quest. This is the Tabula Smaragdina. The whole secret of the Philosopher's Stone is supposed to be concealed in this pretty short document. But Professor Rotanzi says Newton was seeking the Philosopher's Stone not to become rich by turning metal into gold, but as part of his search for God's secrets. The alchemists believed that this document not only described how God created the universe, it also enabled the alchemist to imitate the work of God. And by imitating the work of God, he could achieve miracles in nature. He is not a magician in the sense that he wants to master these forces so that he can use them to do marvelous things. It's ultimately to understand the mystery of, and secrets of God's creation. Newton believed God had handed down his secrets to disciples like Noah and that they survived in fragmented form in scripture, ancient text, myths, and especially in alchemical literature.